have people who are working on the environment, professionals in science and engineering that really deeply understand the social and governance aspects of these problems is really a valuable thing because so many of the solutions will succeed or fail based on social factors and not just technical factors. Welcome to Climate Conversations. I'm Rajesh Kasirangan, and we have... Hi, I'm Laura from ClimateX. And I'm Kurt Newton from MIT's Office of Digital Learning and ClimateX. And we are going to talk today about chemicals that move across boundaries. And policies to <laughs> block them. Yes. Or manage them. Yeah. And we have Professor Noel Celine from the Institute for Data Systems and Society who's going to tell us all about how international treaties are arranged to solve those problems. Yeah, what, what really goes on at some of these things, I think uh, we're going to get some interesting insights, somebody who's been directly involved in a bunch of these things. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in some of those rooms. Well, and I believe that MIT students are going to get a little glimpse of that with the new minor. Yes, yes, indeed. And we'll hear uh, more about that from Noel as well. Let's take a listen. We are so happy to have Professor Noel Celine of the Institute for Data Systems and Society here at MIT and also with EAPS at MIT. I'm happy to be here. Welcome, how are you? Good, thanks for inviting me. So, Noelle, how did you get to MIT? Wow, how did I get to <laughs> MIT? <laughs> <laughs> it was right up the road, yeah? Yeah, so um, my work at MIT really uh, bridges several disciplines. So, you know, it's, it's linking atmospheric chemistry and policy. And so my background really is in both. I was an undergrad, I did all my degrees up the street at Harvard, I was an undergrad in environmental science and public policy and really focused more on the public policy end of, of research and did a lot of work on chemicals policy, worked with, with the US EPA, uh, spent a year working with the European Environment Agency on chemicals policy. And then when I went back to graduate school, I really focused on the, the science end of it and thinking about chemicals that cross borders. And so I studied in the Earth and planetary sciences department at Harvard, and then joined MIT first as a postdoc. And MIT was the place where I could actually link those two things together. So I was a postdoc with the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change. And in that group, really, it's half social sciences and economics and half atmospheric sciences. And the research really integrated the two things. So at MIT, I really found like I had a place where I could address these coupled challenges that involve society and the environment together. So it sounds like you were interested in that sort of merger of the science and the policy as an undergraduate from a young age. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. What was that like, trying to trying to do that sort of interdisciplinary work uh, well, as a youngster? I mean, I was in, in an interdisciplinary major. It's very similar in conception to the um, interdisciplinary minor that we're just launching at MIT, which is the environment and sustainability minor that links governance, policy, and science. And so we had to take classes in in both the, the science of the problem, but also in government, public policy, sociology, and other aspects of environmental problems. So it was really a, an integrated, holistic treatment of environmental problems. And that's really necessary because when you're dealing with the environment, you're dealing with a system that's influenced by people. Yeah. What got you interested in, say, pollution initially? I really initially was sort of a, um, a policy person. Uh -huh. um, I grew up in the Boston area and was al always interested in government and local politics. And I also had an interest in science. And those two things really merged in a, in a very clear way in the environmental area, where uh, what we were, the decisions that we were making as a society were really affecting the environment. And you, you talked about the, the challenges that occur when the science and the policy meet for you. What kind of challenges do you face in that area? So, I mean, one example is chemicals, which is sort of one of the first areas that I explored. And you're thinking about toxic chemicals that are so persistent in the environment that they last for a really long time, both in the air and in environmental systems in the land and the water. Uh, so you can see chemicals that are human-made that transport globally that are present in the Arctic and that bioaccumulate in the Arctic food chains and then pose threats to people there. What's an example of one So of those chemicals things? like DDT or PCBs, uh, mm -hmm. um, so-called persistent organic pollutants. Okay. And one of the first areas where I got interested in the intersection of science and policy was working on these substances. And at the time, they were the subject of 
increasing international regulation. Uh, so there was a regional agreement with the US and Europe, and then eventually a global treaty. And so starting when I was an undergrad, I was working with the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency team that was doing research on these substances, but in order to inform the global treaty negotiations. So I was able to see that process through and really understand how the substances travel, but also the efforts to regulate them, and then think about what human actions and human policy actions and what effects those policy actions could have. And do you find that policy normally follows on quite well from science, or is there a big disconnect for you in, the, in where those two meet? Well, I think what um, what research teaches us is really there's no clear boundary between policy and science. <laughs> uh, so that what's really? defined as policy and what's defined as science really is negotiated. And on a case-by-case basis in in every area, that negotiation is really what's interesting. What gets considered as something that policymakers get to decide and what's considered the domain of scientists. So can you give us a specific negotiation that either you've participated in or that you have found fascinating? Uh, so one negotiation that I've participated in uh, and actually took students to a few years ago was the negotiations of the Minamata Convention on Mercury. Uh, So I did a lot of work on Mercury as a graduate student. I continue to work on Mercury here at MIT. And in 2013, negotiators worldwide were finalizing a global treaty on Mercury. And the interesting part was that was the first global environmental treaty since the Stockholm Convention on persistent organic pollutants. So that was a 12 or 13 year span from the finalization of the Stockholm Convention. And So it was the first time that countries of the world had gotten together and negotiated a a new standalone environmental treaty. And this regulated mercury uh, worldwide. And I had 10 students from MIT with me at the final negotiating session, which was in Geneva. And we went, it was during IAP. So it was a great opportunity to witness the negotiations, but also present some of the latest science. And, you know, thinking about what that what that science was, what the negotiators really needed to know at that point, and also seeing the process of how the final treaty text got negotiated and got finalized overnight at four, five, six in the morning um, <laughs> on the day after it was supposed to be finalized. Wow, that is exciting. So it was it was a few years before the Paris Agreement. And that experience of taking students, um, it was funded by an NSF career grant. And the experience of taking students to negotiations really prompted me to say, how do we get this feeling of getting students to understand what goes on in these international rooms when negotiators from all these different countries are talking about policy and talk, making decisions that will affect the environment? I've heard it said that, especially in the context of, say, the Paris Agreement, when people are complaining about how hard it is to get international agreements to work, that these these much more specific treaty agreements, whether it's uh, it's about ozone or mercury or one of the recent refrigerant chemicals, those are places where it seems to work. I wonder what your perspective is on where these kind of agreements can be successful. I think it's always hard. Yeah. And if you watch the process of negotiations, one of the things that students are always surprised about is is how slow they are and how long it takes for people sitting in the room together to actually come to agreement and the rituals of those negotiations when people have to have to thank the host government and and make political statements first before you actually get to hmm. negotiations that's that's particularly hard often for science and engineering students <laughs> who really want to get right down to the nitty gritty but there is a a ritual involved and that kind of getting to know one another and really building that rapport over time happens in all of these different areas. Obviously, climate is a particularly difficult area because it touches so many different sectors. So if you think about negotiations, when countries come to the table, they have to make sure that things are okay with transportation and energy and all sorts of other different sectors in their economies. And they're constrained by all of those things when they're talking to another country who is in turn constrained by all of those things. So this is fascinating. And I mean, maybe it's kind of glacial when you're watching it on the sidelines. But do you think that people are already prepared to make certain kinds of concessions and it's just a ritual to get there? Or are there things that are actually being negotiated on the spot? I really do think in in a lot of these cases, people are making compromises on the spot, and right. uh, especially in the very last 
last bits of the negotiations. I mean, that's that's why people are sitting in these rooms and that's why there's back and forth with governments at the very last minute to see what you can and can't agree to. So let's say I'm a negotiator and I feel like I'm ready to make an offer. What kind of legal authority do I have? Because I'm, after all, ultimately responsible to my national government and its needs. So can you tell us a little bit about what people are bringing to the table when it comes to their social or national authority to negotiate these things? Well, the authority is is very prescribed, of course, in terms of a national government and what each national legislation allows negotiators to do. But what I can say is that the personal connections really do matter. And the ability to get to know the person on the other side of the table and put a face to a name. It's not just the United States negotiating with China. It mm. is individuals who are getting to know each other over the course of these two-week meetings that happen twice a year and intersessional meetings that happen often. So when you think about the science that is informing these negotiations, uh, thinking about that on the personal level is really important. Who do these people call upon when they have a technical question? Mm. Um, what kind of what kind of process goes into making these reports. It's often a matter of the people, not necessarily just just the science. So this sounds like one of the last places that we should be pressuring people to stop flying <laughs> to. <laughs> we want them to get together physically. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, being there in person really is important, but that, that actually leads me to one of the things that followed up on me taking students to negotiations. And one of the things I wanted to see was if we could actually sort of mimic that experience by not flying. Hmm. And can we mimic that experience in a normal everyday MIT class and get students the idea and the feeling of being at negotiations? So in the last several years uh, in my class, Global Environmental Negotiations, I've had students virtually following the negotiations. So they watch the webcast and they engage with negotiators on social media, on Twitter, and follow what's going on by watching what's available online. And of course, that's not exactly the same as being there, but I've found that watching the negotiations in real time and actually being able to engage through social media and other tools really does help students understand what it is like to be in those rooms. So you mentioned social media. I remember reading recently that social media has actually changed international negotiations enormously. Um, because people are tweeting things that earlier were somewhat secret. Oh, absolutely. Um, so when I was a graduate student, I worked for the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, and they are an organization, a nonprofit, that does daily reports of environmental negotiations. And for me, it was a good way to keep going to environmental negotiations while I was doing a, a science graduate degree and sort of keep my hand in these these two different pots. But Back in when this was started, this was really the only way to find out about what's going on at negotiations because they weren't webcast. And, you know, any information that came out was maybe a long form email that somebody wrote. But especially for negotiations which aren't heavily covered in the media, it was really hard to get information about what was going on. These days, there's a hashtag for pretty <laughs> much every negotiation you can follow along, and observers have a way to put information out there on what's going on. So it really has increased the transparency. And do you think that's a helpful thing or a harmful thing in terms of, you know, does it ever um, have negative effects on the negotiations themselves when information is leaked that maybe people aren't ready for yet, that the people involved in the negotiations aren't ready to be released yet? I think in general, it's a helpful thing. Um, I think having having the transparency that allows observers and people who have an interest in the issue other than countries to understand what's going on and to to have an opportunity to influence is is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some cases there are closed meetings, and in in those cases that sometimes the final negotiations are done behind closed doors. But in in the majority of cases, I think that transparency really helps people's understanding of what happens, and also the ability of an agreement to really stick and take to work. I want to um, come back to the science. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you've studied chemicals that cross borders, right? So tell us how you study that. Like, you know, there's 
there's, I'm sure, the actual diffusion processes. There's also the social boundaries. So just give us a sense for what modeling looks like. Right. So I use global models to understand where pollutants are coming from and where they're going. And this is really one of the ways that we can try to understand in the context of a negotiation, for example, which countries are affected by which other countries and which emissions from what places are affecting other places downstream. So for example, I constructed as part of my graduate work a global model for mercury. And inputs to the model, you have to understand what the emissions are, where those emissions are happening. The really interesting part about mercury is that you then not only have chemistry in the atmosphere and transport with wind patterns and meteorology, but once mercury is then deposited to the surface, it can then pop back up. Mm -hmm. uh, mercury is a volatile element. Mm -hmm. So there's cycling between the surface and the atmosphere that you have to capture in a global model and that affects where that mercury eventually ends up. So that's what makes it a complicated science problem. And of course, we need measurements. So you know, my group collaborates really closely with people doing measurements of mercury all over the world and uses those measurements to help constrain our model, to help understand both the chemistry, this cycling between the land and the atmosphere, as well as whether we're getting a reasonable answer that could be useful for in the policy context. I saw you give a talk a year ago or so about the co-benefits of dealing with a particular form of air pollution sort of rippling into other places and how, for instance, taking on mercury can affect, say, global warming emissions. Could you say a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. And and my interest in things like co-benefits really spawned from, from my interest in these really toxic chemicals. And it's really broadened to address any air pollutants of damage to human health. So one of the big ones and, and a big global problem is, is PM 2.5, so particulate matter less than 2.5 microns in size that's small enough for you to inhale in your lungs and causes cardiovascular and other kinds of health damages, respiratory damages. Yeah. Where does that stuff come from? So most of it is produced in the atmosphere. So, you know, we have some of it, some of it's directly emitted, but some of it also is the product of, of chemical reactions. So one example is the so-called inorganic particulate matter, so sulfate and nitrate aerosols. And what we can do in our models is we can understand how they form, where they go, and which sources are more important in that chemistry of formation. So others include black carbon and organic carbon. And so when you think about the kinds of pollutants, the, the kinds of sources that are influencing these sorts of pollutants, they're often the same sources that lead to emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So cars, power plants. And so this idea of co-benefits is that if you regulate for CO2, you might get an extra added bonus that you reduce these other sorts of pollutants, which are heavily regulated. And ozone is another, another pollutant that, again, is produced in the atmosphere from oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds. So these are things that we know are a problem. They're a local problem. So the idea that we might see some benefits locally from something that we're doing globally is really attractive in the negotiating context as well. So some of my work is thinking about how, how do we quantify those? How do we understand how much would happen if we just regulated CO2 and got these air pollution benefits for free. So what we found is that, you know, previously a lot of people had thought, well, you know, this might be the case in some developing countries where they have a lot of dirty sources, but we're not sure about the United States because the United States has relatively clean cars and relatively clean power plants because we've heavily regulated the emissions from those sources of the precursors to particulate matter and ozone if not from CO2. So regulating the CO2 wouldn't necessarily lead to improvements in local air quality because our air quality has gotten a lot better over the past several decades. And one of the studies we did, we actually found that, in fact, we did find co-benefits in the US. There's a, there's a long way to go in terms of really cleaning up our air quality. Yeah, I wonder about going the other way too, thinking about, say, uh, polling about attitudes in the United States. People are much quicker to say, I support clean air irrespective of how they feel about climate change as a thing. And so can things like regulations that support clean air be kind of a doorway into helping climate change? Absolutely, but you have to be smart about it. Yeah. And the challenge is to find those win-win strategies and not the win-lose strategies. Yeah, so that's that not the areas where you can clean up the air, but actually have a negative for CO2. And a good example of that is the, um, the recent case of 
the Volkswagen diesels, where the technology that made nitrogen oxide emissions lower was actually hurting fuel economy. So that's the reason why they had this cheat that actually turned it off. The the underlying technology was a win for air quality and a lose for the climate. So MIT now has a new minor in environmental sustainability, and you are one of three teachers of the first class ever. Right. So the minor has um, is an opportunity for students to focus on environment and sustainability questions in a multidisciplinary way, in a way that isn't available in any current major for undergraduates. So there are two core classes that will be required for anyone who's engaged in the minor, and I'm co-teaching one of them, along with Professor Susan Solomon, in, also in EAPS, and John Sturman from the Sloan School. So our task in this class, which is linking the science piece of environment and sustainability with governance and policy, and the other class will link historical pieces and, and engineering aspects, and we'll focus on, on an applied case study. So our class really will try to get students to understand how policy decisions and governance really affects the planet we live on. And that's that's why we've, we've called the class People in the Planet. Uh-huh. Um, and we're going to do three case studies this year. One case study is the ozone hole. Another is mercury in the environment. And another is climate change. Very nice. Awesome. And what are you hoping that, what are the big takeaways you want students to kind of come away with when they finish this course? I really hope that students understand how we live in an earth system that's really dominated by the human influence and that the decisions that we're making as a society really affect the earth on a global basis and that they are also long-term decisions. Um, So take, for example, climate change. The decisions that we make now are controlling the Earth's climate for generations, centuries into the future. And just understanding those timescales and how the dynamics of the system works in combination with how societies actually make decisions about these topics and what the different interests are and why, why it isn't a simple problem. So last but not least, we always end our podcast with a magic wand question. So the magic wand question is, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and it would solve one challenge, problem, puzzle that matters to you and matters to the climate, what would that be? That is a really hard question. (laughs) (laughs) I think I struggle with it because it's such a thorny problem that it really will take a lot of a lot of negotiation and it's easy to think about the magic wand as a particular technology or a a particular solution but in fact what will be needed for actual change that affects the climate is not only that magic wand but a lot of work and compromise and activity globally I think one one area that would help is if there could be an increased awareness of the of the risks of climate change. And you know, we could just wave the magic wand and say, you know, we're all going to agree that this is the best available science if we all could have similar goals. But of course that's that's not <laughs> it's enough that's why it's the magic wand, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> if right. it could bring us to a change of heart like that, that would be magic. That's a very, I think that's a very warming answer. I quite like that one. Well, thank you so much, Noel. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chemical boundaries. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I find these international negotiations around chemicals fascinating. Yeah. Mm. No kidding. No kidding. I really, it painted a picture of how intense and frustrating it must be watching these policy negotiations go on sometimes for months and then not to be enacted until years later, I think that would be something I'd find pretty tough. Yeah, and I, I love the, the statement that actually people are really negotiating and thinking on their feet at the 11th hour, yeah, you absolutely. know, under those pressures. All this stuff just keeps coming down to people and relationships. We, we can't get that out of the equation. Absolutely not. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> people and relationships. I think that we're going to be engaging with that for a long, long time. Yeah, the human side of this equation. Uh, yes. It's more important all the time. For the human side of our equation, 
Laura? Yeah, please do reach out to us. You can email us at feedback underscore climate X at mit.edu. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter, or you can come directly to climatex.mit.edu. And please do rate and subscribe on iTunes if you get a chance. We really appreciate the feedback. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Bye.